Hi, I'm Kirk Holding with the Living in Spokane North Idaho team, and we've got the whole team here today helping us. We've got Scott on camera and Greg and, and Ashley helping us out on keeping us on task. Um, we've got, uh, again, if you're looking to buy or sell in nine days or 90 days, give us a call, shoot us a text. Uh, we're standing by ready to help, and things seem to be picking up here in the spring, and people are getting back out looking at homes again. Um, today we've got a special guest that uh, we wanted to loop in on a lender type video and we got Nicole Shea from Mountain West Bank. She's the uh, VP of the loan department over there or your president? I'm vice president. Vice president, yeah. got it right. Uh, Nicole's been doing loans I, I think since we started real estate with Greg and I, what, 20, 20 years yep. now? Ish, so doing a long time. She knows what she's talking about. She's got lots of experience. Um, I love that she can handle uh, complex stuff and your first time home buyer easy stuff. Uh, if you're a business owner and you've got lots of LLCs, assets, complicated tax returns, Nicole is an expert. Uh, whether you're just starting to look for a home, she's got a heart of gold and can help you get, get ripping. So we've got some questions we've prepared that we wanted to. Uh, Quiz Nicole on to help us get a better feel for what's going on with loans uh, in, in the climate today, and we're going to get to that right now. Okay, we're going to dive right in here with uh, some questions we've got from the panel here about loans to help anyone that's looking to get into the market to buy or you know, looking to sell and buy. Uh, first question we got, we're just gonna hit them here. Nicole, one of the things that drives me nuts is people say, oh, I can just refinance. And refinancing is, is, is free, nothing's free in this world, but what, is it, what does it cost to refinance? That's a great question and there's not an easy answer to that, but I would say a rule of thumb is it costs about 3% to refinance, but you can kind of control what the costs are to refinance. Um, one of the things is dependent on the time of year you refinance because we have to set up a new escrow account. So you currently have taxes and insurance in an account and we don't get to use that account so we have to set up a new one and put several months of taxes and insurance in that. So that's going to be part of your loan cost is setting that up. We have to get a new appraisal, new title insurance and do all the loan pre-qualifying so all of those have fees. The good news about refinances is, is you're going to get that current escrow account back as a refund about 30 days after you close. In addition, if you close, let's say on May 15th, you wouldn't have a payment until July 1st. So you'll get to skip a month's payment. So you'll also recoup those costs. So the costs can seem high and we can roll those into the loan, but you'll get refunded some of those costs too. So the other thing is you can control it with the rate. So if you want to buy down your points and get a lower interest rate, there's going to be more fees. If you decide to take a little bit higher interest rate and zero points, those are less fees. So you kind of have to go through the options to decide how much you want your refinance to cost. Yeah, that reminds me, people will say, oh, well, my lender's offering them this rate. And I don't always like, I just smile. I'm like, well, you know, how are they getting there? You know, that's where you would talk to a loan expert someone that knows what they're doing, they've been doing it a while, they've been in the trenches and understand that, okay, you know, what are they charging you to get to that rate? Are there points? Are there, you know, fees associated with it to get to that great rate? Maybe that doesn't make sense if, if you've got to pay all these fees to, to recoup them if you're only going to be there a year or two. So. Yeah, I think there's a lot of online lenders that advertise these really low rates and they get you that rate, but they don't explain all the costs behind getting that rate. And as long as you have mm. equity, mm. they're wrapping all that into the loan and you don't even know it because they're not explaining things to you and you're just happy to get that low interest rate. So you really wanna understand the cost that when you're doing a refinance. But a lot of times it makes sense. I usually say if you can improve your rate by three quarters or more, it's worth it to refinance because you think about it, homes still are appreciating in value. And even though you're adding more to your loan, it's gonna go up quicker than that amount you just financed into the loan, especially right. if you're saving an interest rate. Yep, great. Uh, next question we had, what's the most important steps for a first time home buyer to get pre-approved? 
there are so many steps, but it's talking to a lender and understanding your income and understanding your credit score and what your debt to income is. Sometimes people, they have a lot of income, but especially if you're self-employed, which I think we'll talk about later, but what can we count as income? Some of the hardest things for a lender to qualify is if you have been on your job. You, we can do loans for people that have been on a job less than two years if you are salary or full-time. But if you're part-time, we want you to be on the job two years. If you're self-employed, we want you to be on the job two years. If you get commission or bonus or any income like that, we can't use that until you've received it for two years. So although it seems like you're bringing home money because you're on commission or bonus income, we might not be able to use that income. So it's really important to understand what can be used or what can't be used. Yes, and as you can tell, there, there's, she just mentioned 10 things, there's a lot to it. It drives me nuts when you know, a buyer says, oh, I, I'm, I'm pre-approved and it's with maybe an online company that they got in two minutes is advertised on the commercial. And you and I both know that you know, to look at tax returns, look at tax uh, credit reports, um, uh, everything that's involved, your bank statements, verify your income to really get truly pre-approved. That can take, could take a week. You know, e easy with with a sharp lender, and it, you know, just yes. it's super crazy that buyers go out with these quick little approvals online, and they're out shopping, spending money, putting earnest money down, and they really haven't got pre-approved. And the more documentation you provide, the better chance you're going to get the real story and catch all of the facts. So it's important to have your credit checked, it's important to look at the income, and it's important to look at the assets too to just make sure we can document those. Okay, moving on. Uh, can I buy a house if I'm self-employed? I know we touched on it a little bit in the last one, but what's the deal? Self-employed, running my own business, how do I get along? You absolutely can. The change is a few years ago um, we used to have stated income loans for self-employed borrowers so if you stated your income and you had good credit we could give you a loan now after the crash uh, we want to verify your income so if you pay taxes on it that's the income we can count and we can get you a loan so sometimes when you're self-employed the advantage is writing off all your expenses so you don't show any income and you don't have to pay any taxes but loan time that's a challenge um, and typically we have to average two years of your self-employed income. So we need to see income for two years and we average it. So if you show income on your tax returns, then that's the income we can use to qualify you to buy a house. So that's kind of the key. Um, a lot of times we can look at your tax returns and say, well, next year, if you show this amount of income, then you should be good. So we like to look at them kind of ahead before yeah, you file. Like, like a long ways ahead. So, I, I mean, if you're needing two years of, of good reportable income to buy that, that house that maybe you're going to transition into or trade up, really, you want to start that process maybe even two and a half years ahead. Sometimes, in some cases, if, if, if you've really been writing off a lot and used to doing that as a business owner, that, that doesn't necessarily work for buying a home. Oh, no. And so... I've kind of told people when you get with your accountant and, and if you're in that boat, maybe that almost maybe even three years ahead, start the conversation with your accountant and with your lender saying, hey, what do I need to report for income here to qualify for you know, this house? Yep. And then decide with your accountant what makes sense to write off that year, those next two years or a year or whatever it is after you guys talk. But there's a lot of moving parts for sure if you're a business owner and how you're reporting your income versus, you know, and how it works with lending standards and what they use for your debt to income and stuff, so. Yeah, I think having that conversation with the accountant is important too, to let them know, like I'm trying to qualify for a home, so they are now in a different gear of not writing everything off, but showing right. you income. Another trick is if your business pays for a certain debt, let's say a car payment, and it comes out of the business account for 12 months, even though that car's in your personal name, if we can prove the business makes that car payment for 12 months, we can exclude that debt. Same goes for credit cards or anything like that. So it's important if you have a business to set up a business account and for business related debts, pay that debt out of that versus your personal account because then we don't have to count that against your debts. Yeah, great. Um, so yeah, moral of the story is get, get started on this stuff early if, if you own your own business. Um, next question, moving on here. All in one construction loans versus traditional loans. Gosh, I, a complicated world I found in, in these building scenarios, but it comes up all the time. Um, 
what do you say to some of these questions? Well, I think construction loans, I kind of say, are advanced loans um, compared to buying a house because you can get into a house with zero down if you use Washington Bond or Idaho Housing. Um, you can't on construction loans. You've got to have equity and you have to have a bigger down payment. You also have to have a contingency account and reserve. So there's a lot more money that needs to be documented for a construction loan than buying a house. So buying a house, you could do zero down, three and a half percent down. So it's easy to get in your first house. Well, now that house is going to appreciate and you're going to get some equity. So then maybe it's time to go build a house. And so maybe you'd use that equity as your down payment. There's other times when you're gifted land or you inherit land or something like that. And so now you've got a piece of land that has equity in it that can count as your down payment and you can build a house. And there's so many advantages to building because you get your dream house. It's custom. It's everything you want. Mm -hmm. But there's just it's more complicated. It is. Yeah. And so, again, you, you definitely want to engage a, a, a good lender when you're getting ready to. You know, most of these are acreage scenarios. I think we found, you know, you've bought some acreage and now you got to do construction loans and there's a lot to them. Uh, you know, big process to it on how they check them and stuff as far as progress, you know, as they build. But um, definitely get with the lender if, if you're looking at that. And um, also we've got some great builders that we can work with that know the process that, that can help as well know what they're supposed to do in the process as far as turning in receipts and taking draws. And yeah, I would say there is a third nature. person in your loan when you're building. You have the builder. And so you want a reputable builder that's going to pay their subs and not put liens on your property so most banks will vet builders and make sure we don't verify their quality of work but we just make sure that they have been paying their bills on time and things like that but you do have another person entering that whole scenario so the other question i get too is do you buy the land people try and do it all all at once it seems like with a lot of banks they want to see you've owned the land maybe even held it seasoned it for a little bit going into that construction loan any any what have you seen with that what are they expecting as far as do so they it, want the loan the land paid off it just depends no it's all about your we look at the project cost of the value of the land plus the cost to build and that's what our project should appraise for and then we'll end up to 90 percent of that so if you've owned the land more than a year we can use the appraised value okay. if you've owned it less than a year we use what you bought it for so if you got a really good deal on the land you might want to hold on to it for a year because now we can appraise it and use that value and you just got yourself more equity now if you inherit the land we will get an appraisal and we'll use that value versus if you just purchase the land we'll use that price okay great uh just touching on a few things on this there's a lot to it but um we'll uh a lot of good information for construction loans we're going to hit the next one here the other question we get a lot is hey kirk i want to buy an investment property what what are you know it could be a rental it could be a fix and flip um how do we do it and i always start with what how are we how are we going to pay for it are we paying cash what are we doing on a loan and again with investment property it's a whole nother can of worms or different process, if you will. Nicole, how do you buy an investment property with a loan? Well, if you are buying a non-owner occupied, you can do 20% down, but if you put 25%, you get a little bit better interest rate, which can help with the cash flow. Also, if it's already rented out, we can use that income to help you qualify, so that's a plus. I would say the smartest people buy their primary residence, live in it for a year, turn that into a rental and go buy another primary. And every year you can do that. Um, the smartest loan I've ever seen is buying a FHA with three and a half percent down fourplex. You live in one unit, rent out the other three, then turn that into a rental and then you can go do that again. You can only have one FHA loan at a time, so you can only do that once. Um, but there you get four units after a year and then you can go buy a primary or duplex and do it again with conventional and you'd have to have more money down. But if you can be patient and do them one at a time, you get the best rate on a primary, then you convert it into a rental and then go buy more. Otherwise, you've got to have cash and you got to have a lot of cash because you need 20 or 25 percent down and mm -hmm. you want it to cash flow. So you need to rent to pay your um, yeah. mortgage payment. Yeah, it's every time we've kind of run this scenario in this new interest rate climate that we've had the last few years. I, I watch the buyer's face as, as they look at the good faith estimate with a seven, eight, nine percent interest rate because they're higher than owner occupied. And you're like, wow, how am I ever going to get rent to cash flow? And I'm already putting 20% down. So 
Love that idea. Uh, one of my regrets, wish I would have done it more. I know Scott's doing it right now. One of his is move in, stay in it for a couple years, get that you know owner occupied rate, um, and then you know move on to the next one uh, to start building those rental portfolios and building wealth, building assets. So great mm -hmm. advice. Um, and in your case, when you're living in one, you might hopefully rates will come down by the time and you refinance it as a primary before you go buy the next investment so yeah. you can get the best rate on that. Because once you leave it, it's now an investment property and um, you don't get that rate. But you get to write it off on your taxes, on your Schedule mm -hmm. E, you get to write off mortgage insurance and taxes and insurance. So it's a great write off once you start getting investment properties. Yeah, I, I think we're going to see more of that people you know, starting as owner occupied and, and staying the course there and then turning, converting those into rentals down the road, uh, mm -hmm. just so you can cash flow and, and uh, deal with the lumps and bumps that come along with, uh, you know, property management and owning investment property. Yes. Uh, next one, how much do I need for down payment and are there any assistant, uh, down payment assistant programs out there? So, um, FHA only need 3.5% down and there's some conventional loans with 3% down. Um, both Washington Housing and Idaho Housing have down payment assistance where they'll, get, I say give you the money, but it's really a loan uh, against the house for the down payment. So it allows you to get into the house. Now, the rate is higher on those. So, uh, so I say, if you can beg, borrow, or you know, get a gift from family members um, for that 3% or 3.5% down, that's the best way to get in the house because you get the best interest rate and then you're in the house. But uh, VA has 100% financing if you're a veteran or USDA, but you have to be in certain geographical areas can qualify with 100% financing. So there's some of those programs around. Um, and again, with any down payment assistance, you're gonna pay a little bit higher rate. So. That means a lot of times you can qualify for less of a house if you take that. So if someone will gift you the money for the down payment, that gets you in the house and that can work too. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, we, we get a lot, a lot of people asking for uh, down pay, zero down type loans. So it's definitely a product in the market with, with the market shifting more towards buyers. It seems like we're seeing a lot. They're coming back. We're seeing more of them and sellers are open to working with buyers to, to help with some closing costs, it seems like. So definitely part of the market that, that we're seeing right now. I believe so strongly in home ownership. I've seen couples that have bought a house and two years later they go to sell and they've made 50,000 in appreciation. And so then suddenly now you've got that down payment to buy another house. Like it's kind of like a 401k, it just goes up in value. So it's a great investment, even if the rates are high, but if you can afford it, you'll grow into that house. Um, we just want to make sure you can afford it, but it's, it's a good investment. Sure. Okay, hopefully you've stuck around for the end of the video here. We're getting down to the last couple questions we got, and there's some good ones. Uh, question is, what's kind of the advantages, disadvantages of, uh, you know, con traditional conventional loan versus VA, FHA, or even USDA? Good question. Um, so we call VA, FHA, and USDA government loans. Um, so those are a lot geared for a first time home buyer and so sometimes there's more flexibility on them. VA loans are for veterans only. So you have to be a veteran and if you're not married and that person wants to be on the loan, you can't be on the loan because it's for veterans and their spouses only. Um, USDA, you've got to be in a rural property and they'll give you 100% financing, but they have some income limits, so it's a little more challenging to find those. So FHA is one of the best loans around right now for first-time home buyers because it's 3.5% down. They are not as strict on credit requirements, so you can have a lot lower credit score. Um, FHA used to have monthly mortgage insurance of 0.8, and it would, or 0.85 and it would stay on the loan for the entire life of the loan. So it was kind of a deterrent for people to get into that. So mm -hmm. they have reduced that to 0.55. FHA rates are about 1% lower than conventional right now. So if, when you go on a conventional loan and if you put 5% down, you're gonna have mortgage insurance, which is insurance that you're not gonna default on the loan. So depending on your credit score, even though you're doing a conventional loan, which I'll explain in a minute, your mortgage insurance might be higher per month. It might be 0.8 or 0.9, where on an FHA loan you get 0.55 and you have a lower interest rate. So 
people are nervous about FHA loans because sometimes houses, they have a higher stand, FHA, VA, and USDA all have a higher standard of when the appraiser goes out there, there has to be a specific appraiser. But they also look for peeling paint or safety issues like the wall covers have to be, or the plugins have to be covered and railings can't be too wide. So sometimes people, when they list a house, they want to say as is and they don't want a government loan. But in this market, I think we're starting to see more houses that are listed are just fine and they will go. So that's where you need a realtor to tell you, will this loan go FHA? Because FHA is a great loan right now because of the interest rate environment we're in. Sometimes when your credit is really good and you've got 5% down, we kind of run the scenarios. And if the mortgage insurance is less on a conventional loan, even though the rate's higher, it might make more sense to do that loan. The other advantage of conventional is that mortgage insurance falls off when you pay it down to 78%. Where on the FHA loan, it stays on there for the life of the loan. But we know we're in a high rate environment, so most likely we're all gonna refinance within the next couple of years when rates go down. So if your FHA loan, you had that lower interest rate and lower mortgage insurance, and then when you refinance down the road, you have more equity, you could refinance into conventional. So you don't have to stay in that FHA loan forever. It, it is, yeah. Um, and I love, you know, explaining the differences. Kind of the second question typically we ask a buyer, have you talked to a lender? And then two, what, what kind of loan you're doing? We need to know what kind of loan because depending on the real estate market and the climate, like when it was the seller's market the last four or five years, it was tougher to get some of these FHA, VA offers, USDA because there's more steps to them, more, more perceived headache sometimes on some of these. And so sellers were saying, nah, I'm going with cash conventional. Market shift now, now a lot of these sellers are, oh yeah, we'd love to entertain you know, any of these offers. And so it's important to sit down with your lender and, and kind of you know, flesh out, if you will, everything that is going on with these to figure out which loan program is gonna be the best for you, gonna be the most competitive in the market. Um, and the only way you can do that is getting in with the lender and I would encourage you to even go meet face to face and bring all your financials. That's the only way they well, can really dissect it and help you. Yes, and the realtor is equally as important in this when buying a house because if there's a house that's got a great price and there's going to be 20 offers on it, um, an FHA may not be the top mm -hmm. one they pick. They yeah. might want a cash offer, they might want 20% down, so you have to sometimes have patience with these to find the right house right. that you don't have competing offers on. And a lot of times the listing agent will call the lender to talk about the borrower and we can't disclose anything specific about you, but we can say, yep, they're a strong borrower. They've got me all my documentation where we feel good about them. And so that can help aid them to accept that offer. So it does kind of depend on the market and your realtor knowing the market and, pay, and checking in with the listing agent to see if they're open to taking a mm -hmm. government loan. Yep, yep, no, for sure. Uh, okay, we are gonna hit one more question here. Last question for Nicole today. Um, and we get this a lot. People would like to move right now, but they not sure they wanna sell their house, maybe keep it. Uh, you know, without selling the house, they don't have the down payment and just aren't sure what to do. And so the question is, can I use equity from my current home to purchase the new home, you know, without, before, without selling it essentially? So what would, what would you say to someone? How would you help them through that? And is it even a feasible idea? It depends. It depends on your income and your debt. So if you want to retain that house and your goal is just to retain it long enough to move into the new house and then sell, um, you could take a home equity line, which is pulling some of that money out of that house and using it as a down payment for the new house. So during that time, you'd have your first mortgage, you'd have your home equity line, and then you'd have your new mortgage. So we have to make sure you can make all three of those payments. Now, when you sell this house, you're gonna pay off that home equity line and you're gonna pay off your first mortgage. So then you're just set with the second mortgage. So that sets you up well, but you just have to make sure you can qualify for that. Now, if you're planning on turning that current home into a rental, if you get a rental agreement and the deposit and the first month's rent, we can use 75% of what you're gonna rent that house to offset that mortgage payment. So you could still use a home equity line for the down payment if you don't have cash. So we would have the three mortgages still, but we could use some rental income to offset the 
HELOC payment and that mortgage payment. Right. So it just really depends on your whole financial picture, whether mm -hmm. you can do that or not. No, no, absolutely. So again, a lot going on, but it's an answer to, you know, I don't know what to do. And I don't, you know, right now it's been really tough making contingent on sale offers because sellers didn't want to go for that. Mm -hmm. So this was an option or is an option for, for those that qualify, can swing both debt to incomes. Um, and not have to sell the home and, and make, get a better deal on the purchase because they're not making a contingent on sale offer. Don't have to move twice is another mm -hmm. another big thing um, on this strategy and, and it's a good one if you can if you can make it work. So again, uh, we want to thank Nicole for being here with us today. A lot of a lot of good stuff. Hopefully it was helpful. If you found value in the video, give us a like, hit that subscribe button, and tap that bell for notifications because we're putting new stuff on every week. So. Uh, again, whether you're looking to move in 90 days or 90 days, give us a call, shoot us, text us, an email. Um, you can tell Nicole's been doing it a long time. She's sharp, knows what she's doing, and, and can help you get pre-approved, and then we can take it from there and, and help you find that dream home. So thanks again, and we hope to uh, show you around town soon.